welcome back to the NWA 1983 project. I'm your host, Lex G, and with me, as always, is Matt Riley. Hey, Matt, how you doing this evening? Oh, I'm excited. I'm jacked and pumped. All right, all right, fantastic. So tonight we are in Georgia for Georgia Championship Wrestling, also known as World Championship Wrestling. Tonight on the program, we're going to see Ole Anderson versus Kurt Hennig, Buddy Rose versus Magnum TA, Dick Slater and Barry Windham, Tommy Rich versus Bill Mulkey. That should be a great contest. We have Tony Atlas and Rocky Johnson versus Nikolai Volkov and Ivan Nikolov. Ronnie Garvin versus Invader number one. In our main event this evening, we have Larry Zabisco versus Mike Rotunda. Invader number one. Yes. Invader number one being uh, very notable in the wrestling world for, the, for being the man who uh, stabbed Bruiser Brody, which led to his death. So Georgia Championship Wrestling was formed in Atlanta in 1944 by promoter Paul Jones. He operated for about 30 years or so. He was assisted by Ray Gunkel. When Paul Jones passed away, uh, Ray Gunkel became owner of Georgia Championship Wrestling. Uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling being notable for being on TBS in its infancy and being one of the shows that carried that network into a national expansion. When Ray Gunkel died of a heart attack uh, in a match against uh, Ox Baker, by the way, Oh, wow. Uh, it did set off some problems. So Ray's widow, Anne, thought that she was only getting a, a piece of the promotion. Unfortunately for her, um, that piece was sold to Bill Watts. Ah. Uh, the, promotion was being, uh, the promotion was renamed Mid-South Sports, and that's when the Battle of Atlanta happened. So basically what happened at that point is that Anne split from uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling, made her own promotion in Georgia, and they had these two rival promotions going at it. Uh, one being the Mid-South Sports, as Bill Watts had called it, the member of the NWA uh, versus All-South Wrestling Alliance. It didn't last very long due to the fact that the NWA would pour talent into that. And that was kind of the function of the NWA. If you were a member of the NWA and a rival promotion would be in your area, they would send talent, they would do other um, nefarious things, um, oh. they would threaten wrestlers to blackball them if they were for that promotion, and usually, nine times out of ten, the uh, National Wrestling Alliance that, you know, won for the most part. Yep. So also in that, uh, that management change or that owner change, Jim Barnett, who was also uh, owned a piece of it for quite a while, and he's the one that actually came up with the name of uh, World Championship Wrestling, who had used that in previous promotions, uh, most notably in Australia. So one of the most interesting part about Georgia Championship Wrestling is basically what happened after it folded. So it was sold for approximately $900,000 to the WWF and Vince McMahon by Jack and Jerry Briscoe, who at the time owned pieces of Georgia Championship Wrestling. The remaining 10% was owned by Ole Anderson, who was not aware that they were selling it to Vince McMahon and came into work one day and realized he didn't have a job. The interesting part about that is that Georgia Championship Wrestling is really, really thought together with World Championship Wrestling and Jim Crockett Promotions, but Jim Crockett didn't necessarily buy Georgia Championship Wrestling. When Vince figured out that Georgia Championship Wrestling would not work on that you know network, he did sell it to Crockett, at least the time slot, which is with a 605 time slot, um, to Jim Crockett for a million dollars, which bankrolled the first WrestleMania. So the interesting thing about that is that the WWF, when they purchased Georgia Championship Wrestling, they did not purchase their um, tape library at the time. So that went to Crockett somehow some way or at least to ted turner because he ended up with the uh the library after he bought wcw in 2001 but he didn't end up with the the library rights until then so crockett had a hold of them somehow um we're not really sure how how he did that but um jim crockett did own the rights to georgia championship wrestling only anderson did try to carry on with his promotion um after after Vince bought it, but that pretty much ceased to exist um, for a while. They, you know, their main championship, which was the national championship, didn't make it until 1986. So they were abandoned or unified with the equivalent titles. So, so that's yeah. a, just a brief history of Georgia Championship Wrestling. So, Matt, I know you spent some time over in Georgia. What are some yeah. of the memories from Georgia Championship Wrestling? <sighs> well, I mean, by the time I got there, it was long gone. But as a kid... The Tommy Rich Buzz Sawyer feud was one I got really into. It was funny because I, you know, remember the wrestling magazines and you watch the tapes and gotta say, you know, Buzz Sawyer power slamming Tommy Rich in the concrete, way to set up the feud. Yeah, <laughs> like, those matches are extremely bloody too. Lots of blood. yeah, and 
And, you know, I, I, look, I think of, like, Jim Ross saying, you know, you want to have color for certain matches. That, like, set the tone for, like, you know, bloody feuds that went over the top. And I think part of it, too, was that when you bleed that heavily, you, you just open up the next night, you know? It's like yeah. you can't really help it. You know, that Tommy Rich Buzz Sawyer feud is the probably the most notable feud um, they had in Georgia Championship Wrestling. But the thing about Georgia Championship Wrestling, you know, since they were a national television show, um, the NWA would send people that are looking to promote or future NWA champions to Georgia to get national exposure. So you saw a lot of Ric Flair on that show. You saw a lot of Dusty Rhodes on that show. You saw the Von Erichs on that show. You know, going back and watching these clips on YouTube, it was literally a who's who. So you saw Tony Atlas. You saw Hulk Hogan. You saw Andre the Giant all the time. And their show was much different than some of the other shows at the time where it was basically – most of it was interview or promo-based. So it was this, you know, Dusty come out and cut in a promo, then this guy would come out and proto, and then Ron Garvin would come out and cut a promo, and then Ole Anderson would come out and cut a promo. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of, in terms of the studio matches, there weren't, you know, there were basically one-sided squash matches that, have, you know. When you wanted to hear a fantastic, break it off, break it off, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know like, I remember thinking, like, when I was wrestling, like, you know, break the leg, you know, it's like, don't break this guy's leg, come on, what's wrong with you people? They were very energetic and, um... <laughs> Bloodthirsty crowd. Yes. Atlanta being, you know, the hotbed of professional wrestling. And one of the things about their interviews is that they always talk about the Omni. So every promo would be like, you know, at the Omni this, you know, this Saturday, eight o'clock, Mass Superstar I'm gonna take you out. That's one of the things I enjoy about that show is the way they promoted the Omni as something as you know, it's a big deal. It's a huge show. You know, you can consider it one of the wrestling landmarks along with you know Mass Square Garden, Boston Garden, um, the Montreal Forum. And the Olympic Arena, the Sportatorium, the ECW Arena, so on and so forth. And it's yeah. sad that some of these arenas, they're you know, going to the wayside and getting torn down. Because um, I'll never get a chance to go to them. Um, that would have been a, one hell of an experience to kind of go, you know, to kind of see that firsthand. So that's a little sad, I think. Yeah. I think what happens, too, is you, know, you think back and the, the crowds, the way they were, you know, I was like, oh, they're not the same. Well, the venues are different now. They're, they're built so big. Yeah. You know, I, I actually think I'm one of the people that, liked that studio thing and i think now if you look at today's wrestling with nxt and that more intimate setting the fans can you know you can see the fans they can see the action up close it doesn't have to be a 5,000 seat arena it can just be a 400 seat arena and have an awesome show luke's underground the same thing you know like get the right fans in there for the broadcast and enjoy it i was i was always a bigger uh, proponent of smaller arenas for television you know, let your bigger arenas be the house shows or the pay per views or what have you. But for television, I think those small arenas give it a more intimate atmosphere. I mean, look at the ECW arena. Now, the matches at ECW, and, and guys, go back and watch the actual matches, not clips of the matches, because hardcore TV was a clip show. So they would clip the matches. But if you go back yeah. and watch the whole shows, a lot of those matches don't hold up and they're not very good. But the crowd was so energetic, and it was the same people every week. Or every you know three weeks, whatever they came down to the ECW arena, and it worked, and the arena became a character all on its own. Right. Georgia Championship Wrestling was hosted by the one and only Gordon Soley, who also was the uh, announcer and host for the Florida Championship Wrestling show um, as well. Gordon is probably again in my top five, my personal top five of all time in terms of announcers. Like, he's so good. Yeah. And he just if you if you're running a serious angle, and you want to get over how serious it, serious it is. Gordon Sully is your guy. I always, I, I think like how Jim Ross is or considered, and Sully was kind of the predecessor in that selling the athletic competition of the match, not just, you know, look at this guy. Like, he talked about their athletic background and prowess to help sell the dangers. Like, you know, when he put the, the big man puts that move on him, he's, he's hurting him, you know, right? Uh, and helps sell those feuds. And I was recently watching a, um, a YouTube clip of Ole Anderson's big turn. Uh, Ole Anderson had been an adversary of Dusty Rhodes for quite a while, and then you know he turned and became a ally. But the way they did it was that even though Ole Anderson was a babyface, Dusty Rhodes didn't trust him. They didn't want anything to do with him. And for mm-hmm. a year, that built up. It was like Dusty wouldn't you know put him in tag team matches with him, and the other babyface was like, "No, Ole's a good guy. Ole's a good guy." All this kind of good stuff, and then at the end, Dusty finally was like, "All right, you can come and team with me. You know, we'll take out these guys." And then Oli turned on them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Oli comes out. He's like, "It was a plan all along. It took me a whole year to get to you to, you know, to get to you, Rhodes, and I finally got to you." And 
<laughs> yeah, you don't see stuff like that nowadays. And I think the WWE um, could use a continuity expert to go in and just you know make sure that they're doing stuff you know within their own characters and stuff that makes sense sometimes. Yeah, you know, it took him like a year to, to do it, and he did it, and he got to him. So, so you know, you fans of Jim Crockett promotions, the Ole Anderson Dusty Rose thing's been going on for quite a while. So. You also saw the debut of the Legion of Doom, not the Legion of Doom as we know them in the WWF, the, the stable the Legion of Doom, which was Kevin Sullivan, Jake the Snake Roberts, and the Road Warriors. That's why, yes. <laughs> you know, people get confused with the name Legion of Doom and the Road Warriors because a lot of times when they come out, it's like the Legion of Doom, Road Warriors. You know, they're the Road Warriors. Legion of Doom was the name of the stable, so a lot of people didn't understand that. And then when they came to the WWF. They just called them the Legion of Doom, which made it even more confusing for, for people. But yeah. Legion of Doom was the Paul Ellering, J.T. Snake Roberts, Kevin Sullivan, and the Road Warriors were the Legion of Doom. J.T. Snake Roberts and the Red Karate Pants, by the way, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> yes, Jake's Red Karate Pants. <laughs> Fashionable to somebody. Also, you had the Fabulous Freebirds, who were I don't know, a mainstay in Georgia. On the, although they did move around quite a bit because of their reputation. But they did an interesting thing one time where the Freebirds broke up. And this is before Buddy uh, Buddy Roberts. It was just basically Terry Bam Bam Gordy and Michael P.S. Hayes. Uh So they do this thing where, you know, Michael Hayes loses the match for for Terry Gordy. Terry Gordy is like, I don't want to team with you no more. And he gets a new tag team partner, which is Jimmy Snooker, who was wearing a cowboy hat, which is awesome. (laughs) Anytime Jimmy Snooker wears a cowboy hat, you know he means business. Yeah. So Michael P.S. Hayes left for a while. And then he cut this, you know, this promo about, you have to see it. I can't give. I can't do it justice, but it's fantastic. And a little, you know, real world stuff here is that Terry Gordy had an encounter with Michael P. S. Hayes, and Terry Gordy brought out a silver cup, and apparently Michael Hayes had given that to his son. Oh, and they actually named him, his name. His son's name is Ray Ray Gordy. He was, you know, a wrestler as well. And they actually used, you know, he said his name. He was like, oh, I gave that to Ray. You know, Terry's like. You're not my friend anymore. And then he takes the cup, puts it on the floor, and then steps on it and crushes it. Okay. And that sets up the feud. That's it. You know, they got back together eventually at some point. But you know, it was it was a heavy angle and the emotion from Michael P.S. Hayes, he was almost in tears. <laughs> you know, I was supposed to be my best friend, and I gave this to your son, I gave this gift to your son, and you destroy it, and that <laughs> kind of stuff. So <laughs> it was a pretty heavy angle, you know, especially like in eighty one or eighty two, whenever that took place. So it was fantastic. I, I always like too is that you know the feuds were more. Like I said before, in other, our other tube cast, they always felt more personal and more bitter. They weren't, you know, shenanigans. Yeah, they were about succeeding or using the feud to push your propel yourself beyond the opponent. As limited as it was in many aspects, they did a lot with it. The wrestlers they brought out, the tag teams, the feuds were always engaging, and I think that's why, like, you know, Gordon Soley was the mouthpiece. Uh, but they also were smart about the pipeline of talent, you know. Yeah, it was always not, you know they always had the best talent, you know, in the NWA. Again, it was one of the strongholds, one of the uh, the strong promotion. And I can't leave out Bullet Bob Armstrong and the Armstrong family, who were huge in Georgia. You know, during the the sixties and seventies, you know, Bob Armstrong was the Hulk Hogan of that area. He was the top dog there uh, for uh, you know a ton of you know a long stretch of time, you know, a long period. So Bob Armstrong, and then his sons, you know, Brad Armstrong, Steve Armstrong, and the Road Dog, you know, you know put him in there as well. <laughs> Road uh, the, the famous uh, Armstrong family. So it was good stuff overall. I mean, I think, I think sometimes it gets forgotten about a little bit. I mean, you know, you talk about the NWA, people talk about Dallas and World Class, people talk about Mid-South, people talk about Jim Crockett promotions. I think, you know, Georgia gets left out um, a little bit. And you know, people need to understand. Like, it carried, it carried TBS. TBS would not be, you know, a thing. TNT would not be a thing. That Turner, you know, conglomerate was, you know, carried by Georgia Championship Wrestling. Well, I, I remember too is the programming on that station was always very colorful. Uh, <laughs> TBS was awesome. Well, I would say if, if you grew up in that '80s era, you probably enjoyed seeing uh, Mark Singer and Beastmaster. You had Andy Griffin show was on all the time. <laughs> of course, you also had Clash of the Titans, which was always on. <laughs> and then you would get like your colored versions of the, you know, Wizard of Oz, which is weird, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> it would be that. And then they had Braves baseball too, which is which is awesome. Oh, Braves baseball! I will, I will admit to uh, becoming a fan of the Atlanta Braves 
with stars like David Justice and Ron Gant <laughs> and Steve Avery back when they sucked. And <laughs> it was because, you know, almost every week there was, you know, this matchup's a fantastic matchup. Oh, no, fans. We're out of time. <laughs> We've got to go. And, and even before that, always cutting in to pr- bring the baseball. And I guess it was the idea they thought, well, we'll bring in more fans. Yeah. It was funny they had wrestling as the lead into Atlanta Braves baseball. Think about that. Yeah. You, know, you, you want to get the wrestling fans to watch your baseball. <laughs> yeah, that, that's real interesting. So, And then, you know, you can't, you can't mention TBS or Atlanta or Georgia Championship Wrestling without the time slot being 6.05. Uh, which was Turner time. Trying to explain Turner time is like explaining quantum physics here. So, yes, <laughs> what Turner time was, you know, it was basically the only channel that did it. All the shows would begin at 05 on the hour or 35 on the half hour. Some of the theories behind Turner time is that they would get their own slots on the um, TV guide. And TV guide, folks, for those who don't know, was a magazine that you would get weekly and tell you what was on TV and what was upcoming. And another of the theories about why they did it was that it would let people surf, you know, channel surf, give them time to like, oh, I went through 18 channels, didn't find anything good, but this is starting now. Right. You know, once you were watching TBS, you had a hard time to, you know, change the channel to something else because the other shows were already on by the time this show finished. And lest we forget, celebrate, celebrate, Superstation TBS. Yes. So, you know, that's how Turner Time worked. And was it effective? Was it not effective? I'm not 100% sure. Um, but it's something they did up until, I, I would say, the 2000s. I don't know when they actually stopped doing it. But I remember watching, like, Saturday night, and they were still doing it. So, like, 98, 99. So, yeah. You know, real interesting there. Ted Turner, one of the world's biggest wrestling fans, by the way. He's an eccentric billionaire, I guess you would call him. I don't know if he's a billionaire currently. But, you know, he's one of the uh, rich dudes. And he's was very influential in the WCW because no matter how much money he lost, he always wanted to keep you know, wrestling on his channel. Until the villain of my childhood, which is Jamie Kellner. And one day we'll get into an episode about Jamie, Jamie Kellner. He's the person who canceled WCW. <laughs> so when Eric Bischoff and his you know conglomerate went to buy it, they said, you can buy it, but we're not going to give you any times on our channel. So he's the reason why we don't have WCW. He's also the reason why we don't have cartoons on the WB network anymore. Really? Yeah, he canceled all those shows because he's a dick. So like your, you know, your Batman and Robin, your Justice League, um, those shows on that channel was canceled because he didn't like cartoons. <laughs> Which is interesting because he, I believe, he was the president of Cartoon Network at one point. Wow. Yeah. Thanks a lot, jerk. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other uh, topics I want to get into on this episode of the project is tag teams. So Matt, who are some of your favorite tag teams of all time? Well, all time uh, is pretty easy. Most of them come out of the NWA umbrella, starting with the Midnight Express. Yes. Particularly the Lane Eaton version, which was kind of like when they kind of hit the stride and really got popular. Yeah. Condry had just lost a scaffold match and they fired him and brought in Stan Lane. Oh, you don't know that story? He left. Oh, he left? He disappeared. Disappeared? Yeah. <laughs> so one day, like, um, Jim Cornette tells us stories that, you know, one day we saw him, we're like, oh, we'll see you tomorrow. And tomorrow came and he wasn't there. And then he pretty much just disappeared off the face of the map for, for a couple of years. Originally, Cornette wanted to bring in Tom Pritchard as Eaton's partner. And Dusty's the one who suggested Stan Lane. So that's the reason they got Stan Lane, because of Dusty. Really? I, I always like Stan Lane... And my favorite thing about Midnight Express, and this is an underrated thing, is that when Jim Cornette was cutting the promo and laying out the various angles and feuds and so forth, the reactions, the facial reactions between Bobby and Stan Lane helped sell each of those lines. Yeah. Because, like, there was one time they were fighting the Fantastics and Cornette's talking about whipping the guy's mother, and they're, like, just, ooh, in the back, you know, they're selling it. And to me, that was part of it. And they also, you know, the matches they had were very good. Yeah. So it was sort of one of those things, like, it's always said, it's like, when you take a veteran caliber player and add them to a professional team, you know what they're doing, you know, you know what you're going to get with them, the professional about it. That's what Stan Lane was to me. And I like the feuds they had for the most part. Yeah. Now, the only time they ever got kind of crazy was when they had the stupid dynamic dudes thing. <laughs> Ugh. But, 
Uh, I'll back up. Uh, other tag teams, I was a fan of the uh, Fantastics. So, um, you know, I mean, I know they were the good guys, but still, work rate, you know, entertaining. They were fun to watch. Uh, I hated the Rock and Roll Express as a fan, but I appreciated them as a worker uh, because they just were the rag dolls. And, and, like, you think back, and it's like the same thing with Dusty Rhodes. I used to hate Dusty Rhodes. But you look back and go, my God, that guy could work a crowd, yeah. you know? And you appreciate the other things he brought to the table besides a physique. Yeah. Oh, man, other tag teams. The Ding Dongs. Of course. No, oh, yeah, no, the <laughs> Uh, they would ring the bell in the corner. And if anyone has not seen the the ballad of the Ding Dong, so please go on YouTube and check that out. They had a ballad in the corner, <laughs> and they were awesome. Um, they didn't last very long. That was a Jim Hurd uh, thing in WCW. Oh, Jim Hurd. <laughs> he had Jim. the he had the Hunchbacks too. Did he? I don't think they ever made a debut on TV. But his his idea was that we're going to have these wrestlers that have hunched backs, and you can't pin them because. Their hunchbacks would raise their shoulders off the canvas. Well, I don't think that I ever got it off the ground, so oh, bless his heart. My favorite tag team of all time is Demolition. And people are like, ah, oh, Demolition? I'm like, yes, Demolition. You know, growing up in the 80s, Demolition was my team. I don't know if it was the black leather and the studded spikes. I don't know if there was the face paint. I did like Mad Max, so that was cool. But underneath all that stuff, you had two really good workers. So you had... You know, Bill Eady, who was the mass superstar. He was also one of the machines. And overall, just a fantastic worker for someone his size. I mean, he was like 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, and if you see some of his early stuff, you see how good he you know, he is. And then you had you know Barry Darso as Smash, who was also Crusher Khrushchev in the NWA. He played a giant Russian. When he slimmed down to be in Demolition, he was also a fantastic worker. Maybe not as popular as the World Warriors, but I think they were better workers than the World Warriors. And they could carry a match. You know, they did have some of the greatest tag teams probably in the history of wrestling to work with as well. But you know, yeah. with them with Fuji, you know, made a you know a great package. And I did like the turn, the double turn they did at Survivor Series with the powers of pain, so I thought that was fantastic. I love that. Yeah. I like demolition only because we used to use the demolition drop on freshmen in high school. <laughs> That's another story. I was never a big WB tag team guy because the teams always seemed kind of cartoonish. Compared to like the NWA tag teams, right. but all time I enjoyed going more further south. But the Sheep Herders, yes, when they were heels, not when they were the Bushwhackers. Bushwhackers. Um, although I will say, a friend of mine once walked from a train station in Boston to his home and did the Bushwhacker walk the whole entire way, <laughs> That's awesome. uh, without stopping because he was very inebriated. Bushwhackers uh, is my fa- my father's favorite tag team. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I, I mean, I liked a lot of the tag teams. I liked the Freebirds, of course, but yeah. uh, that was more of a case of you know bad guys. Now, were you more of a fan of the Gordy and Hayes or the um, the Hayes and Garvin version? Hayes and Gordy. Garvin was okay, but to me, it felt kind of like not cheap knockoff per se. When did like, I don't understand how they transitioned from being the Freebirds to trying to be the world's greatest rock and roll band. That always kind of threw me. Right, I think it was the whole, like, we once made an album with him, let's do the same thing again. Yeah. But I think once you knew the history between the two of them, like, if you knew, like, they were good friends from their WCCW days, yeah. you understood the transition. I mean, it made sense, again, if you were kind of in the know, but, you know, for me as, you know, an eight-year-old kid seeing, hey, that's that's Jimmy Garvin, and he's trying to be a rock star, and he clearly can't right. sing, and I don't understand what's going on here. I mean, that didn't work well for them. I mean, that was kind of the end of the Freebirds, you know, when I saw them. But going back and watching their earlier stuff, you know, I love them. They're fantastic. So big Freebirds fans. How do you feel about them wearing the Confederate flag kind of the way they did? I think it, from a standpoint of a fan and a, you know, not a revisionist history person, it was, there was some stigma to it, but it wasn't the same. And plus, in the South, you had them being the Georgia bad guys, and part of the state flag was the Confederate flag. Right. So when they went to Texas, it was that rivalry. And I always say to people, because people, people are like, oh, well, what's the deal with Texas you know, being a big rivalry? I'm like, if you don't know what it's like knowing somebody from Texas, it's like knowing someone from New York up here. Like, who goes, you know, I've been in the city. Like, all right, good for you. you know? <laughs> uh, in the Texas, it's like very much like a whole thing where it's you know, state pride, and that's fine. But I think that also translated to the ring with the Von Erichs versus the Freebirds. Yeah. You know, almost like a collegiate level type thing. Oh, big time. 
But it's funny because when when the Von Erichs went to Georgia, they were they were baby faces anyway. Yeah, so it was weird. Yeah, they were so popular that they transcended the. Yeah, you know, unlike when the Briscoes would go to Texas, they were heels, and then when they go back to Florida, they were baby faces against the Funk. So definitely, it was more like that Brett Canada America thing. That yeah, was always fun. When Brett was in Canada, he was the good guy. Yeah, and, and understandably too. So we have a write in a write in uh, suggestion. We have uh, from Stephen Blythe. Uh, his favorite tag team was the Hart Foundation. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, I'll, I'll add them to my list. I actually enjoyed their work because they were fantastic bad guys. You know, of course, their teamwork was excellent. They had a good finisher, a good outside the ring manager. They had good feuds, and they were villainous. Like, I'll never forget the time they blasted um, Savage. With the guitar with Honky? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God, he, he shoved down Elizabeth. You know, they did all that stuff with Danny Davis, too, which is, again, underrated stuff, where that Danny Davis, who was the, I guess, the first time they, uh, they've done a heel referee kind of angle, where he, he he screwed, you know, Tito out of the IC with Savage, supposedly. Um, right. He screwed the British Bulldogs. Um, he gave, yeah, the belts yeah, to, yeah. You know, gave the belts to the Hart Foundation. So I think this is the first time. Then he was banned, and he had to be a wrestler, and he was like a job guy. Uh, we also have another write-in from um, Mike Swanson, whose favorite tag team were... Uh, Blanchard and Anderson, also known as the Brain Busters. Yeah, I, well, I'll back up. I enjoyed them, but I was always a Horseman fan. I guess I kind of see them more as a, a unit with a four. Right. But they were also, and I think what happens a lot of time is you don't see as much anymore because of the, the spot fest in nowadays wrestling. Right. You know, but the methodical tag team approach where two guys who were smaller could work together as a team to slow down a bigger guy. And, and they used to actually, I would find, you know, it was a matter of Gordon Soley or Lance Russell or Jim Ross selling it, but saying how, you know, just pairing two single competitors against a tag team wasn't always the best way to go about it because they could outwit you, you know? Yeah. A lot of people are comparing Anderson and Blanchard to the team at NXT called The Revival. Um, I did watch a couple of their matches, and, they're, you know, they're not there yet, but they can be. They definitely have the potential to become a team just like them. You know, we can't talk tag teams without talking, again, the Road Warriors. The Road Warriors, and to your modern fans, it'd be basically like having two Bill Goldbergs. Um, yes. These guys can work a little bit better, though. Their gimmick, or what have you, whatever you want to call it, is they would you know, bum rush the ring and knock the shit out of people and then beat them like in a minute, two minutes, or you know, what have you, and they would dominate guys. And they dominated guys in Florida. They dominated guys in Georgia. And they you would like legitimately look like they were killing these guys. Um, <laughs> they dominated the AWA. Eventually, they did come to the NWA, and it took them quite a while to win the World Tag Team Championship, uh, even though they were dominant literally everywhere else. And I know a lot of people, I know we're not going to you know, talk about the AWA much you know, uh, when it comes to this, but after Hogan left, um, their business did not dip down because they brought in the Road Warriors. So as a unit, the Road Warriors were almost as much of a draw as Hulk Hogan was. Yeah. So I want people to understand that. And when Iron Man hit, um, their music, you know, they get their Road Warrior pop, which the place would just you know, lose its mind. And I will say, uh, on a minor level, I was a fan. I watched a lot of AWA wrestling, and I did enjoy the Midnight Rockers. <laughs> and I loved the whole, you know, pushing them and so forth. <laughs> but I also liked Doug, Doug Summers and Buddy Rose. Buddy Rose? Yeah, it was Buddy Rose. Buddy Rose and Doug Summers, the tag champs, you know, like that was just like, that. oh man. They just looked awful though. Like Doug Summers was like, the term is skinny fat. You yeah, know I mean? just dumpy. Yeah, it was like just, and then you had, you know, Buddy Rose, who's a hell of a worker though. Just didn't have the best body, the best build, but good worker, great promo too. If you ever watch yeah. the stuff in Portland, they're fantastic. Now in terms of tag teams, and this is going to sound kind of odd. That's what I preface this for a moment. This is going to sound strange, but you know, just follow me down the rabbit hole here. All right. One of my favorite tag teams of all time is Lex Luger and Sting. And you're like, why? Why? I don't understand. In 1995, I believe 95 or 96, they did this angle where you know, Sting is your baby face and he's a you know, clean cut baby face and Luger is the heel. Yeah. And but they were still friends. <laughs> yeah, they I were still that. tag team yeah. partners. And I think that's an interesting thing about life because every once in a while, you know, you might consider yourself a babyface, but you might have some friends out there that are heels. But it doesn't change the fact that they're your friend. Right. 
And like Luger would like cheat behind his back and they're like, oh no, we won. Yay. And then Sting wouldn't notice. And I thought that <laughs> angle was, you know, they, I think that got cut short. I don't think it gets the praise. It necessarily, you know, should, but I'm praising it now. I love that angle for the small time they did it. And they won the World Tag Team Championship. So because they were friends, I felt they had a ton of chemistry. And, you know, you ever, you ever saw that, uh, that Steiner Brothers match uh, with Luger and Sting, the one where Nikita comes out? And tries to hit Luger but hits Sting instead. That match right. is fantastic. That's one of the best matches, best tag team matches I've ever seen. And that leads us right into the Steiner brothers. You know, Rick and Scott Steiner being. Uh, uh, well, I'll put it. I, I, knowing who they became, yeah. they were fun at first. Um, I remember a particular match where Steiner took a bad bump and like bruised the hell out of his back. Yeah. And it was like, you know, very physical tag team. But knowing what I know now of them, it's like kind of tarnishes the memory well you know they get the reputation of they would beat up job guys um they would pull vicious pranks in the back rick steiner is a, is a teacher now i believe he's on a school board or a superintendent or a principal of some school now wow and scotty is just scotty he's insane so their move set alone i think kind of pushed forward uh wrestling where you saw like you know a tiger bomb and a frankensteiner and a twirl world uh tilt world suplex and they were doing german suplex and dragon suplexes so i think they really kind of revolutionized you know american wrestling so to speak where you saw a lot of, you know never saw a german suplex before until i saw scotty steiner hit one you know that's just the reality of the situation yeah they were physical and i remember the frankensteiner was one of those moves like at the school everyone was trying to do it's a finisher that transcends like the diamond cutter or the uh, stone cold steiner that kind of like Oh, like people saw it. They're like, oh, he still hits that every once in a while today. Really? He'll whip it out. Yeah. It's like, I can still do a Frankensteiner. And it'll, do it. it'll hit it. It'll hit it. And it's like, oh, shit. Oh, uh, Scotty. I think another underrated tag team that people don't talk about is Doom. Big fan of Doom. I don't. Doom? Doom, yes. Well, that's nearly expected to hear. Yeah, Ron Simmons and Butch Reed, and you know, with a woman or without woman, or with Teddy Long or without Teddy Long. When Doom first came out, there were masks, and people were trying to guess who they were, but there was only two black guys in the promotion. I was say. <laughs> so everyone knew. <laughs> so everyone knew it was Ron Simmons and Butch Reed. You know, Ranger Ross was there too, but I don't think everyone thought it was Ranger Ross, who I believe was in prison for life for for like robbing a bank or something. Really? Yeah. Poor Ranger Ross. I have really uh, um, strange taste when it comes to the tag teams, I guess. Like, I like the Rougeau brothers. I think they're fantastic. You know, they were good. They were they're, I didn't like them as baby faces. I liked them as heels. Well, as baby faces, I thought they were pretty terrible. But as heels, you know, they can definitely, especially their matches with the, you know, the hearts were, you know, unbelievable. I think, I think them as faces, the problem was generally you didn't really care enough about them. Right. You know, it was like, well, they're just, their guys are standing up against Demolition, but Demolition's going to just wipe the floor with them. And you think about how many teams came after Demolition. You had the Rougeos, you had the Killer Bees, you had the Young Stallions. I know they were jobbers, but I actually liked them. They were one of those teams that I was like, you know, oh, they're kind of a fun, you know, they had the look, but Paul Roma just, who the horseman I shall not speak of again, um, <laughs> Well, did you like Roma and Power and Glory though? Because I did. Uh, he wasn't bad, and I like I like seeing I like seeing Hercules and Hernandez get a push. And they had a hell of a finisher. They did that superplex big splash combo, which was yes. neat. You know, they didn't last very long. They're they're you know they're together for about a year, but you know I always have fond memories of Power and Glory. They were like those goofy glasses and half shirts. Oh right, yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh. Funny how kind of the WWF worked like in its early days. Um, they had like their their set tag team. So you had your Samoans, you had your Mister Fuji and random Japanese guy who was with them. Oh yeah. Um, you had your Moon Dogs, and then like in like '85, they didn't have any established tag teams. Like looking at like, the WrestleMania card, um, you had Barry Windham and Rotundo versus um, Iron Sheik and uh, Nikolai Volkov for the belts, and that's a weird combination. Oh my God, Nikolai Volkov! I, I actually fun fact when I was first in wrestling school, when my first kind of quirky assignments was I did ringside photography for a show. Okay. Nikolai Volkov against, oh, God, Cobb Bob Orton, I think, was the main event. Okay. 
And that was like, you know, back in the day, you'd take two ex-WWE guys because Killer Kowalski had an in with them. So they'd lend them out some, like, you know, like third-string talent, fourth-string talent, you know? I remember <laughs> Nikolai Volkov, like, I kept getting out, of, like, moving out of the way because he was slow as hell. So, like, you had ton- plenty of time to do it. Yeah. But he was a nice guy. You know? Or it was nice. It never looked like he worked hard, though. No, I think he was just one of those guys who kind of, you know, was, was uh, coasting, if you will. Yeah. You know, mailing it in. And hey, you know, I mean, some guys do that. And did you know the British Bulldogs debuted a week before WrestleMania? No. Yeah. To the Bret Hart. So they were there, like, right before, like, WrestleMania. So the Bulldogs were a thing. Um, they debuted on the show along with um, Mad Maxine. If you guys know who she is. She was the female equivalent to Andre the Giant. I guess she was, like, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, or something like that. And she was oh, huge. Oh, yeah. Remember? Yeah, she was yeah. in Dallas for a while. And she debuted in WWE. She didn't last long either. I'm assuming they're going to bring her in to fight when he wrecked it, but that never went anywhere. Mad Maxine. She used to be Andre the Giant, too, at one point. So... <laughs> <laughs> Hanging out with Tully Blanchard and Gino Hernandez. It's weird. That's another great tag team was Gino Hernandez and Tully Blanchard, uh, also known as Dynamic Duo. Who you know, A lot of people didn't get to see them because they were mostly in Southwest Championship Wrestling. Joe Blanchard's promotion. That was on the USA, the USA Network before the WWF. So, But they were a fantastic tag team. <laughs> they did a lot of cocaine from what I understand. Wow, well, yeah. I think uh, we look back now and how many guys do you think were actually on cocaine, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. You know, drugs were definitely uh, an issue. Fortunately, it seemed like it got better, but we don't know for sure. You know, right. But that's any sport or entertainment business that, you know, drugs are going to be prevalent. So, you know, you know bless them, bless their hearts. <laughs> um, but speaking of fantastic tag teams, the Twin Towers – the combined efforts of the big boss man, Akeem, the African Dream, along with their manager, Slick. Those were like the first time I've seen like two huge guys put together like that. Like they were both massive. Yeah. Um, it wasn't like King Kong Bundy had another giant partner to, to team with. I don't think we ever got their, you know, demolition match ever. No, you know, they were on top though. They were feuding with Hogan and Savage, but I don't think they ever got a title match. That I recall. I don't remember, uh, you know, frankly. I just, you know, back in the day, the tag teams were generally, it was it was either the heels were killing them right. or the faces were killing It was like the never really ever even odds except for a couple of situations like the Bulldogs and Heart Foundation. Yeah. But what used to frustrate me was that they would often adopt that Ric Flair, like, cannot win unless it's by, de- you know, cheap, nefarious means, which to me always, you know, undersold the ability of the wrestlers. Let me ask you a question, and I know we're talking about tag teams, but I think this is... This is important, and I was thinking about this last night. Do you think Ric Flair's title run and the monopolization of the NWA championship by Jim Crockett Motions hurt or even killed the rest of the NWA territory? Having him keep the belt for that long and not putting others over? He didn't drop the belt to anyone outside of Crockett. Yeah, I I think that does play a part because – let me let me correct myself. He did drop it for the carry Von Eric for right. like five minutes, but I'm not counting. I'm talking about a, a major run. The only time he basically dropped the belt was to Dusty and to Ronnie Garvin. Yes, uh, I I can see that point of view, and I I can think it can be kind of substantiated because what happens if you look now in wrestling, right? They they put the belt on certain people in certain eras, and only those people. Yeah, you know, so you only had that particular person, you know, and I think. By doing that, you devalue the dangerousness of that other opponent in there in that whole promotion, you know? Uh, I remember there was a time, kind of jumping ahead, but there was a time when um, they had Triple H take on, like, the tag champs and defeat them by himself. And to me, that was, like, really bad because it kind of devalued them as a team, you know? It's like, wow, two guys can't beat one dude, really? You know, a handicap match? Because when I looked it up, Flair did not defend the title outside of Jim Crockett promotion after 1986. You know, other than some you know, some shows in Japan did not defend it outside the Crockett promotion. Right. So, like, what happened to the guys in St. Louis? What about Florida? What about, you know, Mid-South? What about Dallas? And that's why it, the NWA kind of fell apart at that point under Jim Crockett's, you know, president, being president. 
So I always wonder if he would have maybe dropped the belt in Dallas, like legitimately dropped the belt to like Kevin Von Eric. Because he seems the most reliable anyway. Or what yeah. if he would have dropped the belt to Ted DiBiase? Or what if he dropped the belt to Wyndham in Florida? Oh, I, I've always felt that Wyndham should have got the belt. He did at the end, but it didn't really count. I think he beat Muda for it. I think he, he had a title match with Flair. I think it went to like a DQ or something. It was probably about like 93, 94 after when Watts brought it back. But even Luger, you know, Luger didn't get his, you know, his run the right way. So with Flair dominating the championship scene and only really putting over Flair, um, Dusty and Ronnie Garvin and not putting over in the top stars in St. Louis and in Kansas City, even in Puerto Rico, you know, those guys never had a run. Even Georgia, these guys never had a run. You know, what are you going to do? And I, I wonder, I mean, everyone says it's like, oh, Vince came in and stole their TV and put them out of business. Yeah. But it's like, he, you know, he stopped touring at 86. I mean, I, I, don't, I know a lot of these went out of business or weren't the same, but he wasn't, you know, necessarily touring in 87. No, he was at Battle of the Belts and, you know, he's at the first Battle of the Belts and he fought a aging Wahoo McDaniel, but... It wasn't like he was going to drop the belt to him either. I mean, he fought Luger in Florida, too, when he was there. He fought Rotunda in Florida when he was there. You know, had a couple of matches with Devon Eriks. I think he had a match with Jimmy Garvin. Yeah. You know, none of that stuff went anywhere. Yeah, and I think I think it's a good point to make because, you know, anytime you want to kind of, you know, to use out of body terms, sell, sell the value of the belt, you have to also have them fight competition that's a legit threat. You know, I think the thing with Flair that got to be a problem for me was I was always a Flair guy over a Hogan guy, but I thought he was a much better performer. What he ended up having happen was he just knew whoever he was facing was going to beat the hell out of him, and he'd lose by DQ or a count out or run in, you know? And to me, that just kind of cheapened the championship and his reign. That's why I hated that part of it. You know, it's funny. When Hogan dropped the belt, he, and he dropped it for a year. It wasn't like, oh, five days and I won the belt back. When they put the belt on Savage, Savage had it for a year. When they put the belt on Warrior, almost a year. You know what I mean? And those yeah. are like they're more definite than like, oh, Dusty won this week, but they took the belt back because the, he was bleeding, or whatever shenanigans are kind of excuse to put the belt back on Flair. Right. And that that may have worked in the territory days, but when you had you know nationwide TV, and at that time they're starting to get results. You know, you had the fan clubs, you had the newsletters out. You know, that shit wasn't going to work. That territory system, you know, that's 1970s territory system wasn't going to work. And those right. dusty finishes wasn't going to work. If you're going to, you know, have Flair fucking win. Fuck well, it. Well, I, I agree. I think what happened a lot, too, was you had the casual fans just get turned off by that stuff. You know, like when you had, uh, remember Luger was fighting Flair and he had him in the torture rack. Yeah. And they were like, it was, it was like American Bash one year. It might have been. It might have been Starcade '88. It might have been. There's so many Flair Luger matches that they'll yeah. kind of you know mix together. I think it might have been True Grit. Always ended with some kind of yeah. quirky, stupid thing that you were just like, you know, if you're not gonna ever give him the belt. Yeah. And I think, like you said, if you took the belt and put it on somebody for a while and gave them a run with it, like elevator Randy Savage. Yeah, big time. You know, he, and that's what I would say too. Like you look at the titles now. Like I know, like in WWE. You know, outside of when Cena had the U.S. title, it really hadn't been worth a lot again. Yep. You know, but you elevated it, right? And I still say that if they wanted to elevate the title, you make someone have a legit run at the record that Hockey Talk Man held. Yep. And I think the only reason they haven't done that is they don't want to bring his name up. <laughs> but, but it's you know legit like have a honking meter, you know, and have him get close to it, you know. Yeah, um, I think not putting the belt on Luger. Um, and 88 or 89 really damaged Luger going forward. So when he won it at the Great American Bash 1991, by the way, it's one of my favorite pay-per-views, it didn't mean anything because they didn't beat Flair for it. And right. were, at least Sting beat Flair for it. Now his first title run uh, yes. wasn't that great. And that's due to his injury. Um, he had that knee injury and then that had turned Luger face. Right. Because the way it was going, he was going to fight Luger in the second half of the 90. And have that fresh matchup, but that that shit was botched. And he ended up, you know, still fighting Flair. He had a pay per view against Sid, and then they go into Black Scorpion. So that thing injury really kind of ruined their booking in 1990, coming off a pretty good year in terms of storylines and creative in 1989. Yeah, 
But you know, I go back and wonder if they would have if they would have put a, the belt on someone who was a big star in St. Louis, if they would have put the belt on DiBiase or Gordy or Steve Williams. I mean, there's a thousand different guys. You know yeah. why? I mean, I understand why Dusty, but why Ronnie Garvin? I have no idea. Some yeah. people say that they knew they were going to drop the belt back in a couple months, and they didn't want to take the belt off them because I think that's bullshit, though. Yeah, I, I've always felt that that was a big mistake. And what they did is that in the long run, is they hurt viability. Like you know, if you had Ted DiBiase win or Steve Williams, let's say Steve Williams came in and you had him demolish Flair, you know, and like, oh my God, you know. Kind of remember, remember Vader was like that, yeah. you know, an established threat, and instead you got the DQ finish. Go back and you know they're available, they're available on the network. Go back and watch them, and like you don't get a satisfactory ending on ninety percent of the shows from Crockett. You just don't. Maybe yeah. the Bunkhouse Stampede, maybe the Crockett Cup, but like even when Flair fought like Road Warrior Hawk randomly, those would not go to a non-finish. We fought Ricky Morton, who go to a non-finish. When yeah. we fought uh, Scotty Steiner, non-finish. Not that those belts should go on him, but you know, have have him fucking beat him. Fuck it. Who right. cares? And, and that's the thing too. I think you there's know, no, there's no shame to losing to the champion. Right. It's not going to hurt you. Exactly. That's the thing too. I always felt like put the guy over. Have him figure four lock, and by making it like he can't beat Ricky Morton. Come on. <laughs> and it's completely ridiculous. So. Again, that's that's the way they always done it. I mean, that's kind of the ways they did it with Dory Funk. That's the way they did it with Terry Funk. That's the way they did it with Gene Kaniski and Lou Thaz. But at that in the eighties, you need to clean wins. You need to clean wins. Yeah. yeah. And you know that goofy, you know, throw them over the top rope shit, or oh. Oh, Rhodes won the championship, but no, he got disqualified, and they overturned oh, the decision. Yeah, forgot about like, that. Like, oh. Sorry, fans. That, uh, Tommy Young, the official, has ruled that because Dusty Rhodes threw him over the top rope, he was disqualified and did not win the match. Yeah. Up yours. <laughs> when you compare it to the WWF, it's like, okay, they, it was a monster factor, so they build these monsters for Hogan to slay. So he's slaying dragons, slaying dragons, slaying dragons over and over again. Right? Did he lose the belt on a controversial? You know, but they did it so cool though with the with the double referees and shit, and it was a big production. It was a big deal, and the highest rated television. You know, that uh, Saturday Night's main event was the highest rated wrestling show of all time. I believe it still is. They really are. Yeah. So, you know, that's how big of a deal that was. And then they did the tournament, and they gave it about to Savage, and Savage held it for the year. And that made Savage, you know, Savage beat four guys in one night. Yeah. To win the championship. That, that was, he's legitimate. You know, yeah. you didn't have to do an Albert draw to make someone legitimate. That's one of my very best friends, when I first met him, was right around the time that happened. He always says, everybody knew I was going to like you when I sat next to you in class and you were drawing a picture of Randy Savage dropping an elbow on the teacher. Yes. As a reminder, Randy Savage is my all-time favorite wrestler. Um, I was just watching uh, videos of him today. I watched actually. I have a three-hour tape of the best of Randy Savage, uh, mostly outside the WWF because I've seen all that stuff already. And he was just awesome. And um, it's a shame that he never, you know, reconciled with the WWE. He's still alive, yeah. Yeah, just had maybe had one more appearance or what have you. But you know, I think. Everything from promos to wrestling skills to the colorful outfits to the you know the hot manager he uh, he had it all and and you know kind of going back to tag teams I think that Mega Powers thing was pretty sweet to be completely honest because I don't know another time where you saw two of your top baby faces team up like that and kind of you know take guys on I don't think it very happened you know very often so first of all I don't think you never really had two top guys like that before. <laughs> You know, Savage was extremely popular as a babyface. I think a lot of people forget that, um, especially during that time. He was rivaling Hogan in terms of everything, and it wasn't like the it was like the houses went down; they stayed the same. You know, they were still yeah. making money, so pay per view buys were you know, about the same. Hogan, you know, was in and out because I believe he was shooting you No know, Holds Barred, which is the world's greatest movie. Oh. <laughs> Dookie, Dookie. So. Uh, I gotta get a rip 'em shirt, but you know, that's a whole other story. 
But I think I think tag teams in the eighties, and they call it like the golden age of tag teams, and I think that's legitimate. It is the golden age of tag teams because there were yeah. so many of them, and they were legitimate tag teams. And you look at today's current roster. You, know, you have your New Day, you have your Vault Villains, you have um, your Enzo and Cash, you have your Dudley Boys. You know, other than the Dudley Boys. And maybe the new day, there's no one that's on that level of a you know, heart foundation, killer bees, um, brain busters, you know, Rougeau brothers that were you know, all really, really good. And, you know, they were they were a draw. They were an attraction. You know, heart foundation matches used to close the show. Rocker matches used to close the show. Yeah. Um, that's because Hogan wanted to leave the arena early, but whatever. <laughs> like, you know, put me on before intermission and I get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> I love him. He's still one of my. He, I'm still Hogan Maniac. I don't care what anyone says. Just, I don't care. He retweeted one of my tweets once, but really, yeah, felt really cool about it for about 30 seconds, and then I'm like, oh, I'm a grown up person. <laughs> nice, <laughs> but it, it's fantastic. So, any other tag teams you want to give a, a shout out to? Oh boy. Um... I'm probably forgetting one or two, but uh, I like anybody who teamed up with SD Jones. I was a big fan of. Yeah. So you like your Pedro Morales, your Iron Mike Sharps. Yes. <laughs> um, I like. I saw one or actually two teams that were underrated was the uh, Strike Force and Can Am Connection. Agreed. And Girls and Cars is one of my favorite songs of all time. I listen to that to this day in my car, <laughs> and people look at me funny. But that's an awesome song. I don't care what anyone says. You can make fun of me if you want to. But Girls and Cars is a cool song, and I let's do it while I'm riding it in my car. Nice. <laughs> that's all that matters. So who did you prefer, the Tito and Martel or the uh, Tom Zank and Martel team? Uh, I liked Tito and Martel just because I felt it just, I don't know, this came across, I think. Zank was always missing that something. Something. You know? something. He was this close. He was this close. He did okay when he teamed with Pillman, but he was always this close. And then I don't know, he didn't have it. Yeah. Didn't do it for me. He he, uh, he has made some accusations about uh, Pat Patterson and Terry Garvin. So, uh, oh, that makes sense. I will I will leave it at that. Um, <laughs> 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 this makes me laugh. Do you consider the Outsiders um, as a team? Do you consider that a legit tag team, or is that more of a two single stars getting together to take on the world? Uh, they were two single stars in my take, and that's, I didn't like those workers anyway. So I liked Hall for a while, or Ramon, whatever you want to call him, but I didn't enjoy. I never really enjoyed Nash's work. I'm personally a big fan of uh, heel Kevin Nash. Um, I'm actually a big fan of stuff he says on Twitter and some of the interviews. So it kind of makes sense <laughs> to me for some reason. Um, so I'm a I'm a Kevin Nash fan. Scott Hall I do enjoy uh, quite a bit as well. Um, did you ever see his work with uh, Kurt Hennig when they were a tag team in the uh, AWA? <laughs> That's right. Old they Scott were, Hall, the Scott, Gator. The Gator, Gator Scott. It was just completely ridiculous. They just came out with a Scott Hall DVD. I hope they got the Gator Scott stuff on there. <laughs> That'd be awesome because, you know, <laughs> I love it. The Gator Scott Hall. Because he's from Florida, and apparently, you know, it was kind of like Skinner before Skinner, which is weird, yeah. too. And I don't know why they did it to Steve Kern, because he was a hell of a worker, and they made him Skinner. Yeah. And he was part of the, he's part of the fabulous one. He's supposed to be good-looking and stuff, and they made him all gross. Yeah. He, he's supposed to be a pretty boy wrestler, and he, he, he wasn't. <laughs> Oopsie. But, like, 91, they started doing weird shit like that. That's when they had, like... Um, John Nord is the berserker and shit like that. He comes no. up with a sword and shit. John Nord. Huss! Huss! <laughs> well, another underrated tag team, I just want to get this in before we go, is uh, the tag team of Fire and Ice, which was Ice Train and uh, got Flash Norton from WCW. They were awesome. Um, two Super Jack guys. They never really did anything with them, unfortunately. Uh, it's WCW for you. Those had Harlem Heat, speaking of WCW, who were you know fantastic. Yeah. You know, they did some good stuff. You had the Nasty Boys. One of the best matches I've ever seen in my entire life. You want to talk about you know Extreme Rules is coming up. You want to see something extreme? Watch the uh, Kevin Sullivan and Mick Foley versus the Nasty Boys. Yeah. <laughs> and those guys just kill each other. It's like, 
It's completely ridiculous, and that's awesome. I don't understand why the Nasty Boys never went to ECW because I think they would have been perfect for ECW. Yes. Like, I think they, probably because they had, what's the name, Axel Rotten and Ian Rotten there already. Yeah. And they were like, we can't have two fat, out of shape white guy tag teams here. They just brutalize each other. Yeah. Just, just, just calm the, 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 yeah. The Nasties could talk, though. I'm not so much for uh, Ian and Axel, but the That's Nasties could really yeah. talk. You know, and they were world, you know, World Tag Team Champions in WWF. I don't think they won the Tag Team Championships in WCW, although I may be wrong on that, but I don't think so. Um, and they were AWA Tag Team Champions, I believe, as well. So, um, so shout out to Nasty Boys, you know, Jerry Sags and Brian Dobbs. You know, we're going to bless them. So. <laughs> and we are out of time, so I'll see you next time on the NWA.